A History of Central Banking and the Enslavement of Mankind by Stephen Mitford Goodson. Chapter 7. Modern Forms of State Banking. Banking was conceived in iniquity and was born in sin. The bankers own the earth. Take it away from them, but leave them the power to create deposits, and with a flick of the pen, they will create enough deposits to buy it back again. However, take it away from them, and all the great fortunes like mine will disappear, and they ought to disappear, for this would be a happier and better world to live in. But if you wish to remain the slaves of the bankers and pay the cost of your own slavery, let them continue to create deposits. Sir Josiah Stamp, former director of the Bank of England. Bank of North Dakota. In 1919, the 48 states of the United States were offered the opportunity of setting up their own state banks. North Dakota was the only state which accepted this offer. North Dakota, capital Bismarck, has a population of 790,000. It is situated in the middle of America on the Canadian border. Notwithstanding its harsh winters, its primary source of both direct and indirect income is agriculture. It ranks first in the United States in the production of wheat, mainly durum, barley, canola, flaxseed, oats, and sunflower seeds. Shale oil obtained by fracking in the Bakken Basin and lignite are the state's principal mining products. Most of the states of America are technically insolvent, and with the exception of North Dakota and her western neighbor Montana, all have been experiencing budget deficits. By way of comparison, California, the largest state in economic terms and currently the world's 12th largest economy, had a deficit of just under $23 billion in April 2013 and pays out $10.4 billion in interest annually. In 2012, its bond debt amounted to $167.9 billion. In contrast to the other 49 states, which have been suffering rising levels of unemployment, North Dakota's unemployment rate has decreased and is currently the lowest in the USA at 2.7%. It also has the lowest default rates in the country. In September 2012, North Dakota had a budget surplus of $1.6 billion. Between 1997 and 2010, its GDP grew by 93.4% from $16 billion to $31 billion. During the period from 2000 to 2011, personal income per capita increased by 127%, from $20,155 to $45,747, while the national increase was 37.4% over the same period. The secret of its success lies in its state bank. The mission statement of the bank is to provide sound financial services that promote agriculture, commerce, and industry. By law, the state must deposit all its funds in the bank, which pays a competitive rate of interest to the state treasurer. The bank pays over all its profits to the state, which in 2011 were $60 million. Over $450 million has been paid to the state in the past 11 years. Most of these funds are used to offset taxes. The bank also provides a secondary market for real estate loans, guarantees for new business ventures, and loans for farmers at an interest rate of 1% per annum. There has been no credit crisis or credit freeze in North Dakota, as the bank provides the state's own credit. By having established its own economic sovereignty, North Dakota has become the most financially viable and prosperous state in the USA. In 2015, the North Dakota Legislative Assembly established a Bank of North Dakota Infrastructure Loan Fund Program, which made $50 million in funds available to communities with a population of less than 2,000 and $100 million available to communities with a population greater than 2,000. These loans have a 2% fixed interest rate of return and a term of up to 30 years. The proceeds can be used for the new construction of water and treatment plants, sewer and water lines, transportation infrastructure, and other similar needs to support new growth in a community. While state banking will not resolve the financial impasse being experienced at national level, state banks in the USA have the potential to provide considerable relief at state government level. Budget surpluses, lower taxes, less unemployment, and higher levels of prosperity. As of December 2016, there were 25 states considering some form of state banking legislation. The States of Guernsey In 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars had ended, Guernsey was in a precarious state. Its roads were in disrepair, the dikes were collapsing, and the economy had slumped. The island was unable to borrow money as it could not raise the taxes to pay the required interest. In 1816, in order to fund public works and a new marketplace, the Committee of the States of Guernsey devised a novel solution. It issued 6,000 pounds in one-pound notes, free of debt and interest. Within two years, all the works had been completed without any addition to the state debt. A further 5,000 pounds, some of them in denominations of five-pound notes, were authorized in 1824 to rebuild the Elizabeth College, founded by Queen Elizabeth I in 1563, and parochial schools. By 1837, 55,000 pounds were in circulation, 
the island experienced increased trade and tourism and levels of prosperity not previously seen. In 1914, the state's notes issued had increased to 142,000 pounds. In 1937, the figure was 175,000 pounds. The cost of printing these notes was 450 pounds, compared to an annual interest charge of 11,383 pounds per annum, 6.5%. By 1958, there were 542,765 pounds in existence. Currently, there are 43.8 million pounds in circulation. Today, Guernsey has a population of 65,400, which enjoys one of the highest standards of living in the world. There is a flat income tax rate of 20% on worldwide income capped at £220,000 per annum. There is no company tax except for a 10% tax on certain banking activities. No capital gains tax, no inheritance tax or estate duty, no purchase or sales tax, no value-added tax, VAT, and no capital transfer tax. Guernsey has neither a national debt nor any external debt. Central Bank of Libya From 1551 to 1911, Libya was ruled by the Ottoman Empire by Italy from 1911 to 1943, and from 1943 to 1951 was under the military suzerainty of Britain and France. The Central Bank of Libya was founded in 1956 and was run as a typical central bank until the bloodless coup d'etat of the 1st of September, 1969. Oil of an exceptionally high quality was discovered in 1959. However, King Idris al-Mahdi al-Sanusi failed to capitalize on this bonanza or use it for the benefit of his people and the bulk of the oil profits were siphoned into the coffers of the oil companies. On assuming power in 1969, Muammar Mohammed al-Qaddafi took control of most of the economic activities in the country, including the central bank, which for all practical purposes was run as a state bank. It operated as a banker of the local bankers and foreign bankers were not permitted to operate. Financing of government infrastructure did not attract RIBA, interest, and Libya had no national debt and no foreign debt. Its foreign exchange reserves exceeded $54 billion, which may be compared to reserves of developed countries such as the United Kingdom and Canada, which in 2010 were $50 billion and $40 billion, respectively. GDP growth during the period 2000 to 2010 was 4.32% per annum, and the official figure for inflation was minus 0.27%. Colonel Gaddafi was described by the mainstream media as being a terrible dictator and a blood-sucking monster. But the reality was that with the exception of the city of Benghazi and its environs, he had the support of 90% of the population. The following benefits provided by Gaddafi explain why he was so popular. Free education. Students were paid the average salary for which subject they were studying. Students studying overseas were provided with accommodation, an automobile, at 2,500 euro per annum. Free electricity, free health care, free housing, there were no mortgages. Newlywed couples received a gift of 60,000 dinar, $50,000, from government. Automobiles were sold at factory cost, free of interest. Private loans were provided, free of interest. Bread cost 15 US cents per loaf. Gasoline cost 12 US cents per liter. Portion of profits from sale of oil was paid directly into bank accounts of citizens. Farmers received free land, seeds, and animals. Full employment with those temporarily unemployed paid a full salary as if employed. Gaddafi's Jamaharia, state of the masses, ensured that the wealth of this country of 5.79 million inhabitants was fairly distributed to all its people. Beggars and homeless vagrants did not exist, while life expectancy at 75 years was the highest in Africa and 10% above the world average. The literacy rate was 82%. Regarding human rights, Libya stood at 61 in the International Incarceration Index. The lower the rating, the lower the standing. The number one spot is currently occupied by the United States. Another major achievement which Gaddafi initiated was the conversion of the Nubian sandstone fossil aquifer system into the Great Man-Made River, which supplies 6.5 million cubic meters of fresh water daily to the cities of Tripoli, Sirte, and Benghazi. The extracted water is 10 times cheaper than desalinated water. The total cost of the project, estimated at $25 billion, was financed without a single foreign loan. Although the central banks of Belarus, Burma, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, North Sudan, and Syria do not fall under the direct control of the Rothschild Banking Syndicate, Libya had the only central bank run on genuine state banking lines, which exhibited the classic symptoms of full employment, zero inflation, and a modern-day worker's paradise. The question arises as to why NATO intervened on the pretext of fabricated human rights abuses, the so-called responsibility to protect. 
Since 1971, when the United States abandoned the gold exchange standard for the petrodollar with the connivance of Saudi Arabia, any attempt to displace the United States dollar as the premier reserve currency has been blocked and opposed with violence. In November 2000, Saddam Hussein of Iraq decreed that all oil payments would in future be made in euros, as he did not wish to deal in the currency of the enemy. As has already been proven, the possession of weapons of mass destruction pretext was a deliberately concocted hoax, and it was this currency decision which cost Saddam Hussein his life and the destruction of his country. In similar circumstances, Gaddafi announced in 2010 the creation of the gold dinar as a replacement for the settlement of all foreign transactions in a proposed region of over 200 million people. Libya at that time possessed 144 tons of gold. What was intended was not a return to the gold standard per se, but a new unit of account with oil exports and other resources being paid for in gold dinars. Gaddafi crossed a red line and paid the ultimate price. Since 2007, Iran has stipulated that payments be made in euro currency. On the 17th of February 2008, the Iranian oil bourse for trading in petroleum, petrochemicals, and gas using primarily the euro, Iranian rial, and a basket of non-U.S. currencies was established. The first oil shipments under the new system were sold through this market in July 2011. This event must be deemed as one of the prime causes for the constant Israeli and American threats to annihilate Iran.